everyone. Caleb here, your favorite neighborhood restorer. And the birds are chirping here in St. Louis. Hope you guys are all having an amazing, amazing week. We had a pretty good one here ourselves. So let's get into some time lapses and I'll be right back with you.
I can officially say I really do like the mortar. The mortar works really well. It's pretty user friendly, but it does have some slight maintenance things until it is fully cure. Uh, you might notice my little bit of burlap hanging here. I have to keep that moisturized and wet over this for a few days just to make for sure it uh, cures correctly and doesn't dry out too quickly. It also keeps some of the sun and some of the wind off, which again could make it cure too quickly and therefore crack. But this top segment about here-ish is pretty much 100% cured and ready to go. It's doing its job quite, quite well and looks so, so much better <laughs> than this, which is uh, has no mortar in it. A lot of it's washed out. You see the deep cracks. And of course, this section as well is missing one stone. This section, as you guys saw in the time lapse, was missing a whole lot of stones. Yeah, this section here from down there all the way to the tippy top of this stone here, this was all missing. And I didn't necessarily read this anywhere, but because I had so much vertical space to cover and not very much horizontal with the gaps I had to fill, you can see I've turned a lot of the stones up on end. Uh, and that is quite, quite unlike all of the rest of this. But you can see that some of these stones sit vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. So I try to keep with that best I could. So you can see I've laid a lot of horizontals on top of vertical. Uh, these two verticals probably isn't great, but another horizontal, a vertical, horizontal, vertical. That should keep this wall well together and, and looking quite good and all that stuff. You all see there's a little bit of gaps around the steps. I'm actually going to use that other type of mortar I have, which is the Type O, which does have a little bit of Portland just to go around down by the stairs. Cause I do think at the end of the day, this it'll be sitting on top of concrete and probably makes the most sense to do it there. It shouldn't stop any moisture coming in and out of the wall, which again, if you guys remember, is the most important thing about all of this. There's a few different ways you can do this whole pointing on here as far as styles and stuff like that. I went for a quite traditional style. So it exposes the stones a bit further out, kind of, uh, I don't know, makes the wall look pretty to me, to my eyes. Uh, I cannot confirm 100% that this is the exact type that they would have used here. I do see other structures here in St. Louis that have uh, these like raised lines that make it look more like a brick mortar. Uh, and you have, so you have lots of straight lines in between and then they cover a lot of the stones. I kind of wanted to highlight the stones because I think they're pretty. So that's kind of the approach I went with. You can also see underneath every stone and you could probably see this in the time lapse as well if you go back and watch. I actually cut underneath each stone. And what I mean by that is I made a recess underneath all of this. Why I did that is I don't want any overlapping the stones at the bottom because as water runs down, you want it to catch on this and be expelled back out. Again, this will let moisture through and it's supposed to, but you still don't want to feed anything back into the stone. So all of these mortar joints are more flush with the stone below them and then are undercut under the stones above. So every stone's like that. The tool that came in most handy was this thing here, which I ordered off of Amazon. Uh, essentially all it is is a mini trowel and a mini point. I think this is a half inch point. Um, but actually this side became more useful. I think that they call this a leaf. I think that's what it was called when I bought it anyways. Uh, but essentially you have two little tools in one and for getting into these odd, very oblong shapes here, this is way, way handy. And of course, you know, your normal uh, trowel, square trowel there and a hawk. So pretty easy stuff, normal mason stuff. Uh, I ended up using this more for uh, mixing than anything, but of course the hawk comes in handy because you can just kind of put your hawk up to it, push your material in, uh, make it flattened out, and uh, works really good. The last tool you guys saw me use is this uh, brush here. It's just kind of a slightly harder uh, natural bristle brush. And essentially when this stuff got a bit harder, to get out all the tool marks and everything else and to expose a bit of the uh, sand that's in the mix here. Uh, I used this brush here um, and essentially all you do is pack it like this and all you're doing is packing the material further in there. You're removing the tool marks and you're bringing the aggregate to the surface. Again, this is a, a pretty similar finish to what they used back in the day. Um, and so it's the one I went with. It's a really easy process actually. It's a bit time and consuming and I just split it up over multiple days. Uh, a, the setting of the stones does take a while and it does eat a lot of material. Uh, but the other part is we've been having kind of inclement weather here in St. Louis. And so this is the side of the house that gets very little of that weather, but it still gets a little bit wet. And I can't be out here while it's lightning and raining very, very hard. 
Um, so I had to split it up in multiple days because I didn't get enough of any particular day to do it all in one day. This is a, a fun little learning experience to try to figure this all out. And to be honest, for my first, first time ever really pointing anything, ever, I'm pretty happy with it. There are some few problems. The main complaint is, is the second day I was doing this, these areas right here looked exactly like this. Uh, but I put my burlap over it for the night to, you know, of course, slow the curing process, uh, make this all last a little bit longer. And I used the wrong function on my water sprayer, on my water hose. Instead of using the mist function, which is, of course, very light and uh, doesn't have any force behind it, I used the shower <laughs> version. So a little bit of this mortar kind of washed out. Uh, it's something that hurts the wall necessarily. Um, it is maybe something in the future. If I do have problems with it, I'll rake it back out and do it again. Or if it does bug me way, way too much, then I'll fix it then. But the rest of the wall came out nice. Uh, of course, you can see where things are a bit fresher. This will be the color as it dries, this kind of uh, light beige color uh, to white almost. Uh, of course, lime dries white. It's where you get lime wash. It goes very, very light white. Um, and of course this here is uh, still drying, so it's a bit darker, it has quite a bit more moisture in it. Uh, and of course every time it does rain too, you get, the lime kind of goes more transparent and you get more of the sandy color, so it goes more beige, uh, darker beige, kind of like what it looks like here. But overall, quite satisfied with the way it looks. And you know, the old girl can finally breathe again, and that is of course what is most important. Hopefully I will find some good solution for taking off all of these carbon marks. Um, some of this is a little bit of residual cement, most of it is not, most of it is actually um, uh, carbon uh, from the atmosphere, so from uh, cars or burning coal or whatever else like that, uh, stones will absorb that. For instance, the people who like to clean gravestones, you'll see a lot of carbon buildup on marble gravestones, for instance. Uh, limestone is not terribly different, uh, neither is brick, which we have a lot of carbon on the brick as well. Uh, still looking for a few solutions of that. There is a product out there that I do really want to try called D2 Cleaning Solution. I see a lot of, again, the people who clean gravestones using it, uh, and we'll see if I can do that. The other solution I did find was to use a steam pressure washer that uh, operates at very low PSIs, uh, unlike a normal pressure washer, which operates at very high PSI, uh, but uses more heat to clean the stone versus um, pressure. But there's one big problem with that is nobody in my area rents them and I cannot find a single company that uses them. So uh, it's another thing that maybe people in St. Louis don't, uh, <laughs> don't quite know about yet. We don't have the technology, but the technology does exist. Uh, just to figure out a way to uh, ideally rent the machine. And that, if I do that, I will clean the whole house all at once. I did on this side of the stone, remove that little patch of concrete that was driving everybody crazy. Uh, yes, it was driving me crazy too, and it was just a very, very stubborn, tiny patch here. Uh, but I was able to get it off. Uh, did end up busting this stone itself, trying to get it off. So just this little corner down here actually broke in the process. But that's the risk you run when the, the material that's clinging to what you want to clean is harder than what you want to clean than the stone. So the cement's harder. And there is still little bits of cement, for instance, right here. This should be an opening and it still has cement in there. So I have to pry that off. And of course you can see all of the cement. Here's some, here's a big patch uh, that is stubbornly clinging to the stone. Uh, it's worse on this wall than it is on the wall over there that I just pointed. But of course the cement isn't even the worst stuff. This stuff right here, so this is the wall we were just at. This over here, this is looking down to the basement. This is that window that I have the iron gate off of right now. This right here is the stuff that I'm having the biggest problem with right now. This is a material called dry lock. Dry lock is a waterproofer for cement basements. Uh, dry lock should never be used on a stone foundation like this. To my knowledge, there is no stripper uh, that handles dry lock very well. In fact, you guys have seen me in the past try to strip this stuff. It doesn't work very well. So this is a section here actually that I've tried to strip this dry lock crap off. Uh, you see this is by the other back door, not the one that leads into the vet clinic, but the one that leads into my kitchen. In this area, I stripped last fall. Now, of course, it does look better than it did, but there are still tons of it clinging to it. Now, this light yellow you're seeing here, this pale yellow, is actually not the dry lock itself. That's a layer of paint on top of 
this dark gray color, which is the actual dry lock. It is an absolute pain. And I've been using some various tools and I've had, and I've had mixed success with the various tools. Uh, but it, simply put, it's, it's just really gnarly stuff. If you guys have an old house like this, uh, hopefully somebody didn't uh, give you the task of removing dry lock. It is the nastiest stuff to remove. And uh, absolutely a bummer because I have quite a bit of it to remove. Like here, all of this around here, all of this. Of course, this window here, although most of it's just on the stone, you can see how much of the mortar's gone from these walls. Again, this being the back of the house, when the gutter was destroyed or broken, all the water rushed down this wall and most of the mortar from these stones is gone. So it's imperative that I get this dry lock stuff off, repoint this and clean this all up so everything is safe and happy again. All this down here underneath the side door of the house, right there. And even on the more monolithic blocks at the front of the house. And yes, we've been chipping at this stuff ever since I bought the house. Uh, some of it comes up nice, some of it not so much. I mean, even that piece there, look, there's an extra layer under there of fun. <laughs> and if you look really closely at some of the stones, you can actually see some of the damage it's caused. These stones have become very brittle, very chalky, and the top layer of stone actually just comes off. So this is the exact reason why this should never go on this. It damages it. It does not allow the water to exit. Um, and don't think for a second that you're going to ever prevent water from getting in. All you're doing with a substance like this is not letting the water out. So yes, lots of work ahead, uh, but we will slowly get the foundation looking good. Uh, it's definitely one of the goals of the summer is to go ahead and complete the entire, at least the back of the foundation where most of the mortar has been washed away. And also because really there's way more tuck pointing on this section of wall. Because as you can see, the front all the way up, it's just uniform giant blocks. Uh, it's not this way on the inside, of course, but these are still very thick, very beefy stones. And as you can see, much different appearance in the back of the house. And at one point, you can actually see, there used to be a fence right here. You can actually see the profile of it so you can see the carbon buildup. Uh, there was a fence that was that tall that came all the way across, uh, probably touching Mr. Hall's house uh, that is now gone. But that obviously hid all of this stonework from anybody looking from the street. Just like everything in a Victorian house, <laughs> all the money was spent up front and a uh, little care was given to the back. Time now for a quick little Matt and Nikki window update. I have got three of the slashes, this one, this one here, and then one that's actually completely painted on the other side. Almost done, they're that close. Next week I hope to go over to the place and start doing more with the actual frames of the window so I can get these sashes back rocking and rolling. Something I neglected to show you guys last week is actually these really, really amazing sash pulleys. These are all of their sash pulleys, and I believe all around the house, these are all the same and really, really pretty. Of course, this isn't how I found them. This is. So you can see a good comparison here. Of course, when you start a project, you don't know exactly what's underneath all of this. And I'm quite presently surprised. They're really beautiful, and they have like these little crosses with these little kind of like pinholes on them. Just like little tiny points that just add just a little bit extra detail and depth to the piece and they're really beautiful. Uh, of course, uh, these ones are backwards. This is the top with the rounded part. The square part is the bottom. Uh, and these ones roll quite beautifully now. Basically perfect. Whereas they, a lot of them were seized already. And that's why the chain had dug into this one because it was completely seized. Uh, but that comes out pretty quickly. And no worries there. And before I send you guys off, I wanna show you some really amazing items I found this week. These two are new items, this one I've already had. But let's get into this tiny little ticket first. So this little guy right here, uh, I found just kind of randomly on eBay last week. And as you can read here, I'll get a better photo and put it on the screen for you guys now, but the wicked borroweth and payeth not, 
This book belongs in the library of Charles S. Brown. I don't think this is from Charles S. Brown or R. Charles S. Brown. Uh, there was another guy who put together poems and some other stuff and I found books that he helped publish online on eBay and stuff like that. So I do not think this is Charles S. Brown as Charles Swing Brown, the guy who started, the guy who co-founded Hall and Brown Machinery. Don't think it's the same guy, but I just couldn't pass it up. Again, I just thought it was a really cool, tiny little piece of memorabilia. Assuming this isn't our Charles S. Brown, this guy really, really did not like people borrowing and not returning his books. So much so that he had these tags made to put in all his books, so. So I guess if anybody ever finds an old book that says that book belongs to Charles S. Brown, please return it to him. Or let me know, because I think I'd be interested. <laughs> so on to the other really cool find. Some of you a while back might remember that I picked up this little puzzle from somebody who was a 1904 World's Fair collector. Uh, 1904 being St. Louis's World's Fair, so quite important to the city of St. Louis. And of course, Hall and Brown had a display at that fair. As you can see, this was a World's Fair puzzle made by, or sawed by, sorry, Albert Sawinski of Troisdorf, Germany on a bandsaw machine produced by Hall & Brown Woodworking Machine Co. He had a booth at the World's Fair inside the booth of Hall & Brown, and he would sit there and make these cute little puzzles. And I happened to find another one here in St. Louis, and I just can't pass things like this up. Again, I have a photo of him standing at the World's Fair in the booth making these, and my goal is to have enough of these little puzzles, maybe five to 10, where I could actually have a cute little display of these. Again, I, I'm almost positive one of these puzzles would have come home to this house. They would have been here. Now, of course, there are certain condition differences with the two puzzles. My original one has a perfect box, but it's missing one little piece of the puzzle. This one has a bit of a, eh, it's not as good of a box, but the puzzle is in perfect shape and not missing anything. So let me open these two up and I'll show you what they do because they're really neat. So here's what those little sets come out to be. They become almost little dollhouse chairs with some few other random little pieces assorted and a table. I guess you could say these are maybe ottomans or something like that, I'm not quite sure. And these pieces, I'm really not sure if there's any other point than them being part of the puzzle that folds into these tiny little boxes. But they're so cute and knowing that these were something that were A, made on, you know, Mr. Brown's equipment, but also present at his booth during his time at the World's Fair. And here's the new one over here. Uh, one of these were one of the missing pieces, the other one. Now, of course, these are all handmade on the bandsaw, so it's not like I can take uh, this piece and put it into that puzzle or vice versa. The puzzles themselves don't actually fit into one another. They're all custom made, but they're really cute and very cool. I mean, look at the tiny little chairs. They're just, I don't know, just such a neat little piece of history. So yeah, anytime I find these puzzles, I will pick them up. Again, how cool is it going to be to display these items of history in, in a context that makes sense? I mean, right now you guys are seeing them in probably what was Mr. Brown's room. So I, I love the fact that I can find these little bits of history that correlate directly with what I'm doing here. So that's gonna be it for me this week, guys. I hope you guys had an amazing, amazing week and I hope you guys even have a better week this week. I hope to be seeing you guys a bit more often with these videos. Of course, that is all yet to be seen <laughs> as things develop and change. Thank you guys always for watching. Uh, you guys really do make this all possible and I really heavily appreciate that. So be good to yourselves, and I'll see you guys again real soon. Bye-bye.